In this module, we'll look at what the blockchain is and how it works. Be warned, because it's a very complex technology, there will be some technical segments. At all times, we've tried to break these down into easy to digest pieces to make them easy to understand. Back in December last year, I went to a blockchain conference here in Sydney, and I asked many of the delegates to describe the blockchain simply and quickly. The descriptions that came back were pretty technical. There was a decentralized ledger technology, peer-to-peer -peer money, crypto 2.0, a distributed cryptographic ledger, a permissionless distributed database. They tended to be fairly geeky, to be honest, and they described what the technology is rather than what the technology can do. And this has been a problem for blockchain as a whole. There hasn't been an easy to understand description that the press can latch onto as yet. For example, with the internet, we had such expressions as the information superhighway, new media, social media, and the media understood it. The man in the street also understood it. So let's try and simplify the complexity of blockchain by example. Let's say I steal your smartphone. To establish the truth, you and I would normally go to court. There would be a process of law and it would be your word against mine. But let's say there were 5,000 photographers that took a snapshot of me stealing your phone. It's now pretty hard for me to disprove that I stole your phone. Equally, if I wanted to change the facts, I would have to persuade each of those 5,000 independent photographers to change their images one at a time. Now that's just not going to happen because there's a consensus of opinion from everybody that's involved that says, here's the photographic evidence, I stole your smartphone. Now let's put some more pressure on me. Let's say I had to persuade those 5,000 independent photographers to change each of those images in the space of 10 minutes only. Now that's an almost impossible task. And let's take it one stage further. Let's say all the photographs from all the photographers are permanently sealed in a bank vault. And the bank vault has a combination lock on it that has more combinations than there are grains of sand on the planet. So now that proof of me stealing your phone is actually locked in a permanent place and is cryptographically sealed with it estimated it would take approximately 0.65 billion years to crack. But let's say finally we've also got a camera inside the vault. This means that anybody in the outside world can actually see the images of me stealing your phone. In other words, they can see the formal proof. So now we've got a very solid, permanent proof that I stole your phone, which anyone can see. This is how the blockchain works. Except we substitute the 5,000 photographers for 5,000 independent computers connected globally. These are called nodes. And instead of the photographic images, we have data. Now this is where it gets a little technical, so just hold on in there. For this next stage of the explanation of the technology, we will use the example of the public blockchain that underpins Bitcoin. Although, broadly speaking, other private blockchains follow the same broad principles. Now that piece of data is locked together with other pieces of data into a block. This block of data is locked with a mathematical problem that needs to be solved. In the public blockchain, the Bitcoin miners solve that mathematical problem, and by solving that mathematical problem, they actually get rewarded with Bitcoin. Once solved, that confirmed block of data is then broadcast to the other 5,000 computers, in other words the nodes, on the network for their agreement. Once they have agreed that block of data, usually after 51% agreement or consensus, that block of data is permanently locked on top of the previous block of data to form a chain. This usually happens every 10 minutes. In practice, 
it's actually recognized that it takes six blocks to validate a transaction formally. That's usually in an hour. So if someone transferred 100 Bitcoin from one person to another, they would typically wait for six completed blocks to be validated to confirm that the payment is legitimate and has been received. The reason behind this one hour delay before a transaction is recognized as being valid is because of what is known as double spending. Unlike your bank who knows how much money you have in your account at any given time and can authorize a payment, the only knowledge the blockchain has of your ability to pay is from your previous transactions on the blockchain itself. These transactions would include the original transaction confirming you bought the original Bitcoin you are now trying to spend. This information is already permanently locked into the blockchain. Your ownership of the Bitcoin you are now spending will be validated and confirmation obtained that you have not already spent it. If you do not have the Bitcoin, your transaction will not be validated. If you do not own the Bitcoin, your transaction will not be validated. One such example of a blockchain transaction is shown here. Yes, it's very technical, but a key thing to look at is the time stamping, which will become more important later on in this course. One thing to note is that every historical Bitcoin transaction is stored on the public blockchain. This has been in place since it started in 2009. This actually means the size of the blockchain overall is now about 52.5 gigs in size, and that's doubling every year. Currently on the public blockchain, each of the 5,600 connected computers hold a copy of the permanent blockchain dating back to 2009. Now you'll be pleased to know that's the end of the heaviest technical detail. You might just want to replay that last section one more time, as it is very complex. But once you feel comfortable, we can move on to look at what is a cryptocurrency. To give you a better idea, we'll look at the most notorious of all cryptocurrencies, and that is Bitcoin.